With that, I'd like to move on and introduce our first speaker of the morning, uh, Dr. Carol Shields, many of you know, uh, and many of you are, let's do this here, perhaps patients of hers. How many of you are patients of Dr. Shields, Jerry or Carol? Wow, okay, good deal of you. Not surprising being here in Philadelphia. Well, um, I'm sure most of you, I'm sure all of you know Carol and Jerry Shields uh, as the Shields, as they're referred to. Uh, I just uh, just to keep it very brief. Um, some some celebrities are fortunate to to go by just one name, and everyone knows who they are. Michael Jordan, you know. Oh, I want to be like Mike. Well, if you ask any ophthalmologist in the country, if you said Carol, they would say Carol Shields. They know she's famous. Everybody knows her. Same with Jerry. Uh, it's not. Um, it's because of her hard work and her contribution. And and I include Jerry. They're a team. Uh, Obviously, Jerry's here as well. Uh, but they have produced, by far, more papers, uh, more articles, more books uh, than anyone else. They've formed uh, more professional organizations uh, which focus and train doctors in the field of ocular oncology. So we're very fortunate to have her here. Uh, Jerry and Carol are, have uh, just an incredible amount of energy. I don't know where that comes from, but I'm convinced it's a new form of energy, and I think the, the uh, National Energy Institute should study these guys to figure out what's going on. <laughs> Finally, uh, just a, uh, a little bit, not everyone knows, but Carol played basketball at uh, Notre Dame, and so um, she's got it all, right? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, I'll just uh, turn it over to Carol here. Um, you've got a dog. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Colleen, for inviting Jerry and I to be here today. Let's get myself hooked up. It is really uh, an honor to speak to all of you on the topic of melanoma. Uh, I really love this idea of having these patient retreats. I think it's great for us to share with you what's going on from our point of view and maybe help to explain a little bit about why we do certain treatments so that you can understand. Um, I've spoken at a, a previous uh, patient retreat and I really got to uh, say that it was a very satisfying um, experience for me. So here we are. P Peter was intrigued by the title of my talk, The Game of Uveal Melanoma. Well, it is like a game. The strategy is to catch the tumor, eradicate it, save a life, prevent metastasis, and win. That's the strategy. It's a very complex game. In the next hour, I'm going to explain to you how we play this game of uveal melanoma. You know, I've been in practice for 30, 30 years now um, on the oncology service at Wills, and the main bulk of our practice is managing uveal melanoma. It's the number one disease we take care of. Approximately 85% of our patients have a melanoma in the eye. And when you ask a general medical doctor, um, tell me a little bit about melanoma, they only talk about skin melanoma. Very few of them know anything about eye melanoma. And it's, it's nearly our entire practice. It's the entire practice of Dr. Sato and Dr. Carvajal here. So th there are a few select groups in the country that take care of patients with uveal melanoma. If you're in Colorado, you see Dr. Hovland. If you're in Ohio, you'll see Dr. Sabula. And if you're in Philadelphia, you generally see our team. And our team's more than Jerry and I. There are nurses and doctors and technicians. We all work together in our effort to win the game of uveal melanoma. Well, we're, we're going to keep this really simple. I'm going to cover five points over the next hour. I'm going to cover causes of melanoma of the eye, features of melanoma, therapy, a little bit about the collaborative ocular melanoma study, and then last, lastly I'll talk about prognosis. So let's begin with causes of uveal melanoma. We like to divide these causes into host factors, that is what is it about me that puts me at risk for melanoma, 
and environmental factors. What is it in my environment that could have caused melanoma? There are a list of host factors. The presence of anethis, and I'll explain to you what that is, in the eye, or melanocytosis, or even just the way you look, light eye, fair skin, inability to tan are risks for the development of melanoma of the eye. And then in the environment, the profession of arc welding, they're at higher risk for melanoma of the eye and some question about chronic sunlight exposure. Let's begin with nevus. By far and away, this is the most common condition that leads to the development of uveal melanoma. What is a nevus? Well, it goes by many different names. Some people call it a nevus, that's what we call it. Others will call it a freckle in the eye or a mole in the eye. Some people refer to it as a spot or a lesion in the eye, but it all means a pigmented lesion or a pigmented spot in the back of the eye. There are a few reports on choroidal nevus. It occurs in about 7% of white people, maybe 1 or 2% of Asians, so it's more commonly <coughs> seen in white people. Generally, it's pigmented. It's usually very thin. It's usually about the size of a freckle might be on your skin. Often there's overlying age spots on it, we call them drusen, and often the tissue on top of it, the retinal pigment epithelium, looks very thin. We call that RPE atrophy. We can look at an evis in the eye and tell you if it's new or if it's been there a long time just by how sick the tissue on the surface looks. There's some questions. Can a nevus change over time? Can it affect the vision of the patient? Can it get bigger? And what exactly is the rate of transformation into melanoma? I'll answer the questions fast for you. Uh, nevus features do change over time. A nevus in a baby looks different than a nevus in a 70-year-old. A nevus can affect your vision. If it's right under the central part of your vision, it can cause vision loss. And nevus can enlarge. It can enlarge but still remain a nevus. It just grows a little bit. And it transforms into melanoma, one in 8,000. Now, this whole topic of nevus is important to you, and it's also important to me and Peter and Colleen and Jerry because we see every day in our practice many patients with nevi who are sent to see us with a question, is this a melanoma? So we have to make a judgment is that really a nevus or is it a melanoma? We have different ways we can look to differentiate nevus from melanoma because they can look a lot alike. And it's also personally really important to me because I have a nevus. And this bothers me that I have a nevus and I get it checked in our office once or twice a year. Let's look at this first question. Do the features change over time? Well, we looked at a large group of over 3,000 patients with choroidal nevus. And we looked at them based on age and looked at the spectrum of how they look based on age. So based on age, young people tend to have thin nevi, older people, they're thicker. And young people tend not to have much aging change. The drusen, older people, more commonly we see the drusen over them. So here's a plate showing six children with this spot in the back of their eye. This is not melanoma, but it is a precursor to melanoma and only one in 8,000 will turn into melanoma, but every single one of these patients we need to follow at least once a year to make sure it doesn't turn into melanoma. And if you see in kids, the surface of the nevus looks very nice and brown with no damage. As we get older, you start to see some damage. This is mid-adults, all with nevi. This person has two nevi, each at risk for melanoma. We start to see some of the aging changes over it and some little changes in the overlying uh, retinal tissue that tells us the nevus has been there a long time. So I can, when I see a patient with a nevus, sometimes I can say, I know I just met you today, but that spot in your eye has been there at least for 10 years because it's made these changes over the surface. And I can say further, this is not a melanoma because it's been there for a long time. Even as you get older, the nevus starts to show these white spots called drusen and even bigger yellow white spots called pigment epithelial detachment. These are all features that we look at when we try to ascertain whether a nevus is a nevus or a melanoma. Look at the second question, can nevus affect vision? 
Uh, the answer is yes, it can. Again, we looked at the same group of patients with nevi, divided them into nevi under the central vision and nevi outside the central vision. And we found that those that had nevi under the central vision had a 26% risk for vision loss at 20 years compared to those that have nevus outside the central vision. Now you might be thinking, why am I focusing so much on nevus? Because some of you may have relatives who have a nevus, they're worried about it turning into melanoma, and nevus, again, is the most common lesion to transform into melanoma. So this is the beginning of our quest in detecting melanoma in patients. Third question, can nevus enlarge? The answer is yes. They can enlarge a little bit over time. Later in my talk, I'm going to talk about the Collaborative Ocular Melanoma Study. This was a big study performed in, in the U.S., a very important study, and I'll give you some of the details of the study. But in one of their reports, report number five, they looked at small melanoma and talked about nevus and melanoma. And in that study, in the first paragraph, they said, growth of a nevus is presumed an indicator of melanoma. If you see a nevus that grows, it generally indicates it's turning into a melanoma. But it doesn't always mean it's a melanoma. You can sometimes have a little bit of growth and it's not a melanoma. And that's what I want to focus in this little area here. We looked at slow enlargement of nevus in the eye, and some nevi can slowly get a little bit bigger over time, but still remain a nevus. Here's a 16-year-old boy with a spot in the back of his eye. Everyone worried, could this be a melanoma? Ten years later, it's a tiny bit bigger. That worries us when we see a nevus getting bigger. We're worried that it's transforming into melanoma. But sometimes nevi in kids can get a little bit bigger, but not transform. Same as nevi on the skin can get a little bit bigger, but not transform into melanoma. Here's a second case showing a spot in the back of the eye, a little bit bigger over 10 years, but not yet reaching criteria for melanoma in the eye. Here's a uh, patient from Texas who we eventually saw. This was a spot in the back of the eye, a little bit suspicious in its appearance. He was followed in Texas, and the arrow is at the same place Two years later, it has grown by at least three or four millimeters. That's a melanoma. That is not a nevus. When you see rapid growth like that, that's a sign that a lesion, a nevus, has transformed into a melanoma. So this is where the beginning of melanoma begins, nevus transformation into melanoma. So let's talk about rate of transformation of nevus into melanoma. Haroon Singh uh, did a mathematical estimate. He's an oncologist and a mathematician. He said, if you presume that all melanoma in the eye originates from a nevus, here's the risk of transformation. One in 8,845 nevi transform into melanoma. That's if you presume all melanoma originates from a nevus. But I don't think that's true. I think there are melanoma that originate as melanoma. They start out as a melanoma, and there are melanomas that originate from a nevus. It gets another mutation, and then it grows into a melanoma. Others have done mathematical estimates. Ganley, and both Ganley and Singh, Ganley estimated one in 4,500 nevi turn into melanoma, and Singh estimated one in 8,800. That's an annual rate. That means each year, we probably see 5,000 patients with melanoma in our practice each year. We see a lot of patients with um, 5,000 5, nevi. It's, we see a lot of patients with nevi, and probably one of those is going to turn into melanoma. Cavella, who is another mathematician and oncologist in Finland, estimated a, the cumulative rate. If you live to be 80 years of age, that annual rate accumulates. And if you live to be 80 and you have a nevus in your eye, there's a one in 100 chance it's going to transform into melanoma. I'm planning to live to be 80, I hope. And so now I know that there's a one in 100 chance that that spot in my eye could transform into melanoma. 
Remember I mentioned earlier, we can tell right off the bat when we look at a patient, low risk and high risk nevi. Here's an example of a low risk nevus. It has those age spots on the surface. Those are drews and it tells us the nevus has been there a long time. Here's a high risk nevus. In fact, I think this is a small melanoma. It doesn't look at all like this. It's the same size. They're both measuring about four millimeters. How do I estimate size? We estimate size because we know this um, it, this is called the optic disc. The optic disc on average is about 1.5 millimeters in diameter and the distance from the edge of the disc to the central vision is 3 millimeters and this is how we estimate melanoma and nevus size. We look, we take that as our yardstick and then we superimpose it over the tumor and we say oh that's a 6 millimeter tumor. So here if I take this distance from here to here and superimpose it it gets right about to there, so I'm estimating this is bigger than three millimeters. It's about a four millimeter nevus. That's how we estimate size when we estimate size in the eye. I always tell the patients, don't move. Whenever I say don't move, that's because we're estimating size. <laughs> I usually allow them to breathe, but I say. <laughs> Sometimes when we balance the picture on their chest, we say don't breathe because then the picture falls off. But anyways, so these are the same size, but this is the melanoma, and I'm going to explain to you how we know that's a melanoma. We can see overlying risk factors, orange pigment, and some of you really sharp will be able to see. This looks like a little blister where the retina is a little bit elevated, and that's subretinal fluid, and that's another feature that tells us that a nevus is not a nevus, it's probably a melanoma. So we looked at choroidal nevus transformation into melanoma. What are the features of the nevus, which is so common, to transform into melanoma, which is so rare. And this is one of our most important papers that we published. We published this in 2009. And right here, this one sentence says it all. In that sentence, we devised a mnemonic to recall the factors to help us identify nevus transformation into melanoma. And the mnemonic we devised was to find small ocular melanoma using helpful hints where the T stood for thickness over two millimeters, the F for fluid, S for symptoms, O for orange pigment, M for margin at the disc, then using helpful hints stands for ultrasound hollow, halo absent, and drusen absent. And using this mnemonic, all of these features, we can look at that same lesion. And this lesion had seven of eight factors that tells us it's at risk for growth. That's how we can identify melanoma at a really early stage. And if a patient has one or two factors, their relative risk. You learned about Kaplan-Myers yesterday, and today you're going to learn about relative risks. Relative risk means this lesion has a risk of X amount compared to a lesion that is the same size that doesn't have any of the same features. For example, if a patient has a spot and it has fluid and symptoms, if you compare it to a spot without fluid and symptoms, it gives you the relative risk. So if a patient has two factors, fluid and symptoms, they have a three times greater risk for turning into melanoma than a patient who has a nevus without fluid and symptoms. That's the relative risk. It's always compared to a patient without those risks. So if a patient has seven risk factors, there's a 21 times greater risk for that spot to turn into melanoma. We use tests. Those of you who've come through our office, and I'm sure through Peter and Colleen's office, have all these tests done. These tests are really important. OCT, optical coherence tomography, autofluorescence. These are the two painless tests. This test, I always tell people, it's like getting a massage with your eyes closed. <laughs> and then this is the test that most people don't like because either it's okay or it makes you nauseated. Fluorescein angiography. Here's OCT. We just shine a little green light to the back of the eye. It gives us a little cross section right through the middle of the spot we're looking at and it gives us the cross section of the back of the eye and shows us the overlying retina and then these are the drusen, a sign of chronicity with this nevus. And then this here is the tumor, and it gives us information about the tumor. We've looked at 
how to differentiate nevus from melanoma using OCT. And we found one thing that's really important, shagginess of the photoreceptors. What exactly does that mean? We had a lot of features here, but when we look at our OCT, it shows the retina up here. Here's the nevus or melanoma down here. But if you see on the back of the retina, that's where your rods and cones are. And if they get this real shaggy, messy look, that's a sign that this lesion under here is a melanoma. It's a sign that it's fresh fluid causing the photoreceptors to become swollen, we think, or macrophages on the back of the retina. Here's another example of shaggy photoreceptors seen with melanoma. Autofluorescence is a test that we do that tells us if, if the nevus or melanoma is causing irritation to the overlying retina. So here's a nevus, benign, not cancerous, and a melanoma about the same size in the back of the eye as this nevus having a completely different autofluorescence. So the nevus, there's two of them here, show very little on autofluorescence. The overlying tissue in the eye is not really upset or perturbed or sick. When you have a melanoma in the back of the eye, it irritates the back of the eye, and you can see it causes brightness on autofluorescence that tells us it's fresh irritation of the retinal pigment epithelium, and that tells us this lesion has only been there for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, not long enough to cause death of the, this tissue. So we use autofluorescence a lot to help us understand how long a spot's been in the back of the eye. Here's another example of nevus, benign, versus melanoma, malignant. About the same size, about the same thickness, both in the back of the eye, but this nevus has been there so long that it caused blackness of the overlying tissue. That tells us it's been there so long it actually caused all the tissue to die off. Whereas melanoma, which hasn't been there that long, caused again the same finding, brightness in the overlying autofluorescence. This is a really important part of our testing for small melanoma. And again, we had published on that in about 50 cases, showing the difference between nevus and melanoma on autofluorescence. The second risk factor for melanoma is melanocytosis. When Arun Singh was working with us, we wrote a report on risk of melanocytosis in stimulating the development of melanoma. And we found one in 400 patients with melanocytosis develop melanoma. And I know you're all thinking, what is melanocytosis? This is melanocytosis. Look at this person and tell me, what is different between the right and the left eye? You can, can you see? Yeah, it's sort of obvious when you look. It's asymmetric. There's a kind of a blue-gray discoloration around this eye. That man was born with that birthmark. That's a birthmark where he had a little bit too many melanocytes in the periocular, in the tissue surrounding the eye, and in the eye. And that excessive melanocytes, these are pigmented cells, can lead to the development of melanoma. So this is another risk for melanoma, one in 400 risk. All of us have friends with this finding. So you need to warn your friends who have different colored eyes to get their eyes checked. Here's another patient, brown eye, dark brown eye. This dark brown eye with dark brown whiteness, you see the white of the eye is really dark, that eye, that's a birthmark. That has a risk, one in 400 risk for melanoma. The same here, this is a little bit more subtle. Patient has oculodermal melanocytosis, a nice blue eye, and a slightly darker blue eye. That darker blue eye is at risk for melanoma. Another patient, blue and a brown eye. That's easy to pick up. Whenever you have different colored iris, you should get your eyes checked, and this is one thing we check for. Melanocytosis at risk for melanoma. Here's a young girl we just saw recently. Brown and chocolate brown eye. The chocolate brown eye is at risk for melanoma. So this is basically a birthmark. You see it at birth, excessive melanocytes. Melanocytes are the cells that can produce melanoma. These cells are at risk for transformation into melanoma. And in the back of the eye, we see the same thing. Really dark back of the eye, 
And here's a small melanoma starting up in that eye with the birthmark, <coughs> melanocytosis. And sometimes it doesn't even involve the entire eye. Sometimes it's just sector. And if you look at sector, melanocytosis, it's easy to see. Here's a brown eye, and that sector brown pigmentation is at risk for melanoma, excessive pigmentation in the eye, and even in the back of the eye. In the back of the eye, we can see a nice retina, the optic nerve looks good, the central vision looks good, but there's something funny. It's a really dark discoloration down here and very light up here. We would call this blondness to the back of the eye, and this is melanocytosis, at risk for melanoma. So it's really important to get these eyes checked at least twice a year for melanoma. Now I'm going to get into a really important host factor that can lead to melanoma. Light eye color, fair skin color, and inability to tan. Same features that produce a risk for skin melanoma can produce the risk for uveal melanoma. Ezekiel Weiss, I know someone in here is his patient because I heard you were in from Canada. He's from Canada and um, when he was at Harvard with Shirag Shah, they worked with us in doing two reports. One report was they looked at every published study on identifying host factors that predict the development of melanoma of the eye. And in their report, it's very hard to understand all of these techn technological and you know, scientific terms, but basically they found the relative risk, now you know what it is, compared to a patient without this risk, Patients with host factors of light eye color, fair skin color, and inability to tan had about a two times greater risk than a person who didn't have light eye color, didn't have fair skin color, and didn't have inability to tan. And they had looked at 133 published reports. So here's a, a painting of a person at risk for melanoma. You see the blue eyes, the fair skin. That's the type of person at risk for uveal melanoma. Here's a picture of someone. This person took their picture yesterday on their Macintosh computer. That's me. <laughs> I took it with um, Photo Booth. I said, look, at, I'm at risk for melanoma of the eye. Light eyes, light skin, and I never get a tan. I only burn, which is why I work in dark rooms all day. Long time. <laughs> okay, the second study Weiss and Shaw did was they looked at environmental factors for melanoma. Patients come in and they'll say, what did I do wrong? Did, did going to the, the Jersey Shore every year, was that bad? And I tell them, no one's ever shown that it's bad. No one's ever proven that sun exposure is bad for the development of eye melanoma. It is for skin melanoma. For skin melanoma, if you go to the Caribbean and you get cooked, that's a risk factor. You know, for skin melanoma, one of the risk factors is high income. I'm not kidding you. It's light iris, light skin, inability to tan, blonde hair, frequent sunburns, high income. Because you can fly to the Caribbean and get burnt. That's the truth for skin melanoma. Anyways, for environmental factors for uveal melanoma. So they looked at the same 133 published reports. Again, a lot of scientific data. Basically what they found was Arc welding is an environmental risk. They have a two times greater risk for uveal melanoma. And everyone's wondering, sun exposure or living down in the south in you know, Arizona or South Florida, not risk factors as of their meta-analysis. Some studies say yes, other studies say no. They felt it was not a risk factor. So arc welding is really the only proven environmental risk factor. So going to the beach is really not a risk. I always tell people, wear sunglasses, wear a hat, be smart, don't get a sunburn, but no one's ever proven that it causes melanoma. Features of melanoma, I'm not gonna get into this in great detail. Melanoma in the eye is basically pigmented. It's a pigmented spot in the eye. It's much larger than that nevus I talked to you about earlier. Nevi tend to be under two millimeters. Melanoma, the average thickness is about five and a half millimeters. This is what it looks like when we look into the eye. We use our scopes and this is about what we see when we look into the eye. We see the overlying retina looks good. Under it, in this tissue called the choroid, is this brown spot, which is showing signs of activity. There's orange pigment, and you can't see it, but there's fluid in this area, and it's really close to the center of vision. So we worry, ultimately, what the vision's gonna be in this patient. 
The average melanoma is about the size of a pencil eraser. Keep that in mind when I talk to you about prognosis. The size of a pencil eraser at risk for metastatic disease. Melanoma can occur anywhere in the eye. It can occur superiorly in about 20% of cases, temporally, that means out in the side nearest the ear, inferiorly, or nasally, in the side of the eye nearest the nose, or can occur smack dab in the middle of the macula, anywhere in the eye. Tumors that tend to occur in the macula tend to be discovered early. You know why? Blurred vision. Patient comes in with blurred vision when the tumor's really tiny. It's a blessing in disguise if you have it in the macula. You're not going to have good vision in the long run, but it's a blessing in disguise because your tumor's discovered early. Those in, hidden in the far reaches of the eye tend to get large before they're discovered. So macular, the tumors in the center of vision, we call that the macula, on, are on average two and a half millimeters in thickness. You can hardly see them on this ultrasound. There's the tumor, very tiny. It's about the size of a rye seed. Small, very tiny. Tumors that are located uh, more along the equator, a little bit further from the back of the eye, tend to be a little bit bigger, on average about four millimeters in thickness. It's important to know this thickness, because thickness counts. They're about the size of a pea in the back of the eye. As you get more peripheral, tumors on the side of the eye tend to be a little bit bigger, on average seven millimeters in thickness. And there I tell patients they're about the size of a lima bean in the eye. But all of these are fairly small when you consider comparing them to an ovarian cancer, which can be the size of a grapefruit, or some lung cancers, which are much bigger. Melanoma in the eye tends to be relatively small. We'll talk just shortly about therapy of melanoma. Uh, Peter kind of alluded to this earlier. We have many different treatments for melanoma of the eye, with our singular goal being saving the patient's life. We want to do what's least toxic to the patient or to the eye, but give them the greatest chance for life salvage. So we never watch a melanoma, but we watch nevi. Sometimes we laser melanoma or apply a certain heavy laser called thermotherapy. Most of the times we treat with radiation, either plaque radiotherapy or charged particle radiotherapy. Some of you may have had proton beam or helium ion. And plaque and charged particle radiotherapy work along the same physics, and they're equally effective. Sometimes we can cut a tumor out of the eye. Larger tumors we have to enucleate, and sometimes we have to exenerate. That would be my phone, so if you want to. It's in the front, Jerry. Yes, it was a dog barking in my purse. And then the bottom line, and this is where I hope the future of melanoma is. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so enucleation means to take the eye out. Exeneration means to take the eye and all the tissues around the eyelid and the entire orbit uh, has to come out because the tumor is outside the eye. Yeah. And then the last, and I hope this is where the future of uh, ocular melanoma is really developed in improvement in systemic therapies. And you're going to hear more about this later from Dr. Carvajal and Dr. Sato. Okay, so how do we decide what treatment a patient gets? Well, a lot of it depends on size of the tumor, where the tumor is located, the opposite eye. For example, if the patient doesn't have an opposite eye, well, we're not likely to take out their only eye. Um, patient age, you know, if a patient's 80 years old, we tend to want to try to save the eye as much as possible. Patient general health and what the patient wants. Some patients cannot stand the idea that they're going to have a dead melanoma scar in their eye. They will say, get rid of it, take my eye out. Others will say, are you kidding? You're going to take my eye out? You're not taking my eye out. You must save my eye and give me a little bit of vision. So it, uh, we sort of weigh the patient as we talk with them about what the treatment alternative is. Basically, small melanoma, those the size of a rye seed, get treated either with thermotherapy or radiation. Medium melanomas, those the size of a pea, generally get radiation. Sometimes we resect them, sometimes we have to remove the eye. 
because they're in a funny location. And large melanoma, those the size of a lima bean, get radiation or eye removal. Let's talk about radiation because that's the most common way to treat melanoma of the eye. Melanoma is basically chemotherapy insensitive and radiation insensitive. Now, you didn't want to hear that from me. It's not very sensitive to either of our two big guns. So what do we do? We turn up the radiation dose. Like, for example, for breast cancer or lung cancer, the dose of radiation is about 4,000 CGY, centigrade. For melanoma, we double it, 8,000 CGY. It's a powerful dose. It would kill any lung cancer, any breast cancer in a minute, and it kills 98% of melanoma. So it's very powerful. And the base gets a really high dose. This is what the radiation plaque looks like. Um, this is a more recent radiation plaque, which is really custom fitted for the patient. There's many different types of radiation devices. Some of you have had eye removal. I think most of you may have had radiation because that's the more common way to treat melanoma. And this is what the devices look like. It's actually real gold, very expensive. No one gets to take the gold home. Um, uh, the gold plaque is reused. Um, and these little radiation pellets have to be ordered in, and when they come in, they're, quote, hot. They're very radioact radioactive. And we have a physicist place them on the plaque, and they're just super glued in. And I'm going to show you how they're done. <laughs> this is all done by computer simulation. We have a smart computer, which has an eye in it, and we draw the size of the tumor, and then we fit a radiation plaque so that the tumor gets adequate dose. This is the computer simulation of the plaque, and there's the melanoma in the eye, drawn to size. And here's that plaque placed over that melanoma. The radiation physicist who designs the plaque can move this seed or that seed or that seed, just move it on the computer to make the radiation field so that our adequate dose, 70 gray or 80 gray, completely covers the tumor and gives us two millimeter margin. So we allow for two millimeters outside the melanoma to be sure we get all the cells in the radiation field. That's how it's done, and it takes usually a day for a, radiation, a physicist to design the radiation plaque and a day to build it. Here's our oncologist, Dr. Komarnicki. Here's our physicist, <laughs> Dr. Emmerich. Uh, in the operating room at the time, they're uh, members of the radiation team. The radiation is delivered the same day that the patient is treated with the radiation. It's delivered in what we call a lead shield, and it's transported to protect uh, people from getting radiated as they're carrying it over. Here we are placing the plaque surgically. Um, I usually wear a lead neck protector, vest, and skirt. I did my first uh, 20 years without wearing anything, and then I said, looks like I'm going to be doing this for the rest of my life. I might as well protect myself. So I, my second 20 years, I'm wearing lead protection. Also, you'll notice on my finger I have a little measurement of the dose to my body um, to get, make sure I'm not getting too much radiation. We all wear these little measurement devices at our hip and on our finger so that we don't get too much radiation. The way to minimize radiation to us is we work with a dummy plaque. So we place this in, we get everything, all the sutures in so that when we're ready to put the live plaque in, which is this plaque, we take the dummy out, we put this in and quickly tie down and it minimizes our radiation. The plaques are stored in a sterile device that has betadine so infection is not transmitted one patient to another. We rinse it, we count the seeds because after all these are just super glued on and we want to make sure that what the radiation team has given to us is our count and then when we take the plaque out we want to make sure we're not leaving a seed uh, in the patient's orbit. So we have all these counts that go on all the time for radiation seeds and here you can see the plaque is now tied down with long sutures on the eye. This is in the back of the eye with the eye rotated. I always tell patients you'll be sound asleep. You won't have to look right or left. I don't think an, I don't think an eye could look this far right. That's us moving it to the right, uh, just showing the plaque. And then we, we put the tissue back together, sew it together. Um, patients are really comfortable. Actually, you don't feel the plaque that much when it's on. That, 
not most of the time. Um, this is a, a really custom shaped plaque for a little small tumor back near the optic nerve because we had to notch it. And here's the plaque in place, tied down. Now this is the one where it gets a little bit treacherous, where we have to put a plaque right on the front of the eye. Like when you have a melanoma in the front of the eye, sometimes we have to put it right over the front of the eye and sew it down. That's the tissue all sewed down. And nowadays we do all of our plaques outpatient and we sew the lids together and give the patients a big patch and let them go to a hotel nowadays. In the old days, we used to keep them in the hospital. And as you all know, in general, um, after discharge, patients use two medicines. One is an ointment that has steroid and antibiotic. The other one dilates, and it's used for three to six weeks. We check them every four months and then every six months. And it's important to get systemic follow-up too physical exam twice yearly, liver function test twice yearly, once a year chest x-ray and abdominal MRI, and our oncologists will get into this later. So here's what it looks before and after, a melanoma irradiated before and after. But we do, many of you know, little touch-ups to protect vision afterwards. I'll get into that. Here's a medium-sized melanoma before and after another larger melanoma before and after showing great regression. And you see how it turns a little bit white here? Uh, the radiation causes the blood flow to the area to become very thin, to the point that sometimes blood doesn't even flow in that area. And there are treatments we have to give to protect the eye from that lack of blood flow. Here's another one before and after showing excellent regression, tumor completely gone, but the blood flow very thinned out and we have to give some protective treatment. And here's what we do afterwards. Not in everybody, but in many people. We will give thermotherapy. Why do we do that? We think it helps to minimize recurrence. We will also do two things to help protect the vision. We do a little sector PRP. That's called panretinal photocoagulation. And that helps to minimize uh, vision loss. And the other thing we like to do, and that's what it looks like. Let me just go back to this minimize recurrence with TTT. And you see that little red dot here? That's what TTT is a laser that we use to treat the entire scar, and it helps to minimize recurrence. Then we do the panretinal photocoagulation, which looks like this, little dots of treatment around the tumor in the area where the uh, blood flow is reduced and that helps to protect vision long lasting. And we also, we like to give um, an injection into the eye. It's short lasting, but it helps to protect vision for the first two years. So let's look at reasons why we do this. If you look at the collaborative ocular melanoma study, which I'm gonna talk about real shortly, um, they found that when they gave radiation for melanoma, 90% of the time it worked, 10% of the time they had recurrence. And when we combine radiation with TTT, we only have 3% recurrence. So we can reduce 10% down to 3% just by adding that consolidation with TTT. So we like to do the TTT to minimize recurrence. Why do we do the panretinal photocoagulation? It's been shown in a pilot study and other studies that the laser can help to prevent macular edema, which means vision loss after radiation. So we want to protect the vision with this one-time PRP. And then this report that's about to come out where we give the Avastin, it's known as Bevacizumab, hard name to pronounce. Avastin given every four-month interval for two years causes reduction in vision loss in patients who received Avastin versus those who didn't receive Avastin. So this is the rationale for doing these treatments afterwards, to save the patient recurrence and to protect the vision. I'm not gonna talk about, talk a little bit about this. The most difficult melanomas to treat are those that touch the optic nerve. This is a really hard area. It's way in the back of the eye, near the nerve. We have to be really precise in our measurements. So when we size up a melanoma, we measure the base this way which is eight millimeters, as indicated here. We measure the base this way, which is six millimeters. And then we measure the thickness by ultrasound. And then, 
Because this is eight millimeters, we want to give a two millimeter free field on both sides. Eight plus two plus two makes a 12 millimeter radiation field. So we have to irradiate that much on a radiation device that big, and then we cut out the back, we give it a notch. And that's how we radiate near the nerve. It's a little more difficult than radiation at other sites, and we can get excellent treatment following radiation near the nerve, but much higher risk for vision loss. A few words about collaborative ocular melanoma study. <clears throat> this was a very important study in the United States in the 1990s and early 2000s. The collaborative ocular melanoma, collaborative, there were 44 centers, ocular melanoma. We only studied melanoma. And it was a prospective study, so we collected data along the way. And the main goal was to understand which therapy is the best for controlling melanoma and maximizing patient survival. This was their first report, the COMS report number one, to help improve diagnostic accuracy. You know, in the old days, eyes were removed with hemorrhage, thought to be melanoma, or were removed with a freckle, thought to be a melanoma. Well, thanks to this study, we now know that these eyes aren't mistakenly removed that much anymore. Also, the COMS helped us to understand therapies. There have been many reports, those of you who go on the scientific websites to pull up scientific publications, you're going to pull up a lot of the COMS publications. I think they've had like 39 publications or 35 publications, each assessing a different facet of ocular melanoma. The two most important results of the COMS. They did two big studies. One, they looked at medium-sized melanoma, and the other one was large-sized melanoma of the eye. For medium-sized melanoma, that is tumors between 2 and, a half and 10 millimeters in thickness, they found that plaque provided the same prognosis as eye removal. In the large melanoma study, that is tumors greater than 10 millimeters in thickness, the COMS found that there's no need to irradiate an eye before enucleation. In my view of melanoma, I think our best way to minimize, the whole goals of these two studies were to find ways to minimize metastatic disease. I think the best way to prevent metastasis is early detection, and you'll see in a minute why. So metastatic disease for medium-sized melanoma occurred in that study about 20 percent by 12 years. So 80 percent of patients avoided metastatic disease. And in the large study, where the tumors were large, over 10 millimeters in thickness, about 40 percent of patients had metastasis by 10 years, but 60 percent didn't. And most metastatic tumors do occur by about 10 years out. So the last point to discuss in my discussion is prognosis of melanoma. You know, melanoma can be deadly. It's a very serious, it's one of the most serious conditions that an ophthalmologist will see in their practice. How often does the eyeglass ophthalmologist see a melanoma, like your general ophthalmologist who fits glasses? Well, they might see a patient with a melanoma once every 10 years in their practice. And if when they saw you, they seemed a little bit agitated, it's because <laughs> They're scared to death. When they see a patient with a melanoma, it scares them, it raises their blood pressure. They want to get you to a center where you can be treated right away. It is really scary for an ophthalmologist. All ophthalmologists know how to detect melanoma of the eye. Retina specialist. Retina specialists might see maybe five to eight patients a year. And again, they are also a little bit nervous, but not quite as nervous as the regular ophthalmologist, which is why I think it's really important to get into the hands of an ocular oncologist who handle this and have everything at their fingertips who can help you right away. So let's go on with the prognosis of melanoma. It can be a deadly eye cancer. There's a lot of literature on melanoma of the eye. Many reports. This is one report that I really like looking at because this is a very long-term study, very long-term prognosis on patients with melanoma, published out of Finland. Interesting, in the Scandinavian countries, they have a tumor registry 
where, you know, most people don't leave Finland. They live there all their life, and their, every patient is registered, and they all see Dr. Cavella and <laughs> for their whole life. And so he has excellent follow-up on all his patients. You would like him. He has a real, he's a very bright man with a very dry sense of humor. He's a good guy. Anyways, they don't have a lot of patients in Finland, and they don't have a lot of patients with melanoma. But in this series on 289 patients, they found some important data. They said by 15 to 25 years, about 45 to 49 percent of patients with uveal melanoma had metastatic disease. That's half the patients. But let's look at that data. 50% did well. And keep in mind, that data was collected between 1962 and 1981. And it's only a small number. And the median thickness was 7 millimeters, kind of thick. You know, the smaller the tumor, the better the prognosis. They also said in the, the same study that if you're going to get metastatic disease, it tends to occur by 10 to 15 years. 90% of patients, if you're going to show metastatic disease, 90 to 95% had it by 10 years. So I usually tell patients if, when I'm seeing them, if they reach that 15-year goal, chances are they're going to be okay. So patients reaching 10 to 15 years who don't have metastatic disease may be seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. In 2009, we looked at our series, you know, Cavella had 289 with excellent follow-up. In the United States, it's very different. You know, people come to see us from Rochester, then they move down to Florida, then they move out to California, and it's hard to get follow-up. So we looked at 8,000 patients that we had managed with pretty good follow-up, and we looked at risk for metastasis of melanoma. And it really is important to know that the thickness of the melanoma counts. In that big study on 8,000 patients done over 40 years of data collection, we had a one-sentence conclusion. Our one-sentence conclusion, which is really small here, says increasing millimeter thickness of melanoma is associated with increasing risk for metastasis. Now there's different ways to estimate prognosis. You can do it by tumor thickness or classification age or other things. Let's talk about tumor thickness. In that study, Increasing millimeter thickness is associated with increasing risk for metastasis. Each millimeter the tumor gets thicker adds a 5% risk for metastasis by 10 years. So if a patient has a 2 millimeter thick melanoma, 2 times 5, it's a 10% risk for METs by 10 years. If it's 8 millimeters in thickness, 8 times 5, 40% risk for METs. Hence, my goal in my career is to get every doctor out there in America or anywhere detecting melanoma when it's small at two millimeters or less in thickness. Early detection is really important. So if you look at this graph from that paper, kind of zero to one, it's about 5% risk, one to two, about 10% risk. This example here, this is a five millimeter thick melanoma, five times five, it's about a 25% risk for metastasis by 10 years. A thicker tumor has, you know, 10 millimeters in thickness. It's a high risk. It's a 50% risk. But look at this tiny tumor near the nerve. It's only one millimeter in thickness. It only has a 5% risk. There's a 95% chance that patient's going to be okay. So thickness really does count. Now, those of you who are really scientific uh, readers will read about the AJCC classification. This is the American Joint Committee on Cancer classification of cancer. And it's a very difficult classification. Do you agree, Peter? It's a difficult classification, hard to understand, um, but it does predict prognosis of patients. Um, we classify patients based on tumor basal diameter and thickness into one of four groups, the tumor, and then based on that, using Kaplan-Meier curves, you can get an estimate for prognosis at 5, 10, 15, 20, up to 35 years. It's a hard classification to use. Most of us don't base a lot on the AJCC classification. One thing about age, and I talked to one of our young patients who's in the audience, 
Uh, younger patients, so here's a six-year-old boy with a melanoma in his left eye. By the way, he's still doing well, and he's maybe 12, 13, 14 years <coughs> follow-up. We looked at melanoma in kids versus older adults, and we found that kids do have a better prognosis than adults. We think it's related to a better immune system. You know, you heard Peter speak about immunotherapy. Your own immune system can help control metastatic disease. My last thing to talk about today is genetics of melanoma. I specifically left this till the end. You already talked about, heard some talks about this yesterday. Um, it wasn't until this meeting in Whistler, Canada, 2005, the International Society of Ocular Oncology, Bill Harbor gave a keynote address and there were one, two, three, four, five, six papers on the genetics of melanoma. At the International Society of Ocular Oncology just last month, there were probably 15 or 20 papers, and every month another paper comes out on the genetics of melanoma. But these were the first few presentations on genetics of melanoma. It was only nine years ago. This whole field has exploded. Now we can do genetic testing to help us understand which melanoma is at risk for metastatic disease. So the first paper, the one, first one by Dr. D'Amato, who's at the, uh, in Liverpool, he questioned why on earth would we want to do genetic testing of melanoma? What patients should be tested? How do you counsel the patients? It was a very kind of philosophical talk. Then the next talk from Medina in Italy, he said, hey, I've got a way of doing genetic testing by doing a needle biopsy. I don't even have to take the eye out to do genetic testing. And everyone was amazed that he could do it without taking the eye out. Then the next paper from the group that really started genetic testing, the German group, Gabriel Prescher, working with Nor Norbert Bornfeld, they were the first to identify monosomy 3. And then they, in this report in Canada, 2005, they said, hey guys, we found two classes of melanoma, a good class, disomy 3, and a bad class, monosomy 3. And they were the first to really identify that. And then the last paper by Terry Young uh, from Los Angeles, and she indicated that she too was using needle biopsy to classify melanoma based on genetic testing. Since 2005, all of us are, or most of us, are offering genetic testing for melanoma. A few years ago, we looked at a big series of melan uh, patients with melanoma that we did find needle biopsy for genetic testing. And like the previous studies, we found that patients with disomy 3, normal chromosome 3 in the melanoma, or even a little mutation in 3 but not complete mutation, do well. Those that have complete mutation, we call that monosomy 3, have a reduced prognosis. First of all, how do we do the genetic testing and what are the results? We've had 40 years experience with needle biopsy. It's a very difficult technique, sticking a needle into the eye, because when we have our scopes on and we're looking in the back of the eye and we put a needle into the eye, everything's inverted and backwards. So if I put a needle into the eye here, in, as I'm looking in, it comes in here. And if my tumor is there and I go like that to get to the tumor, the needle really is going like that. Is that right? You get used to this up, living in an upside down world with our indirects. Our indirects invert everything, which is why when we examine you, you don't know this, but <laughs> <laughs> we put all of you upside down. We put the table down and we stand at the top of the bed and you're basically upside down to us. So when we look in, our upside down view is actually right side up. <laughs> and same thing when we do this genetic testing, we have the patient upside down, so when we look in, it's right side up. It's a very difficult thing to understand. Anyways, it takes a lot of practice. We've, all of us have had, who do this have had a lot of practice. And in 2005, we started doing genetic testing. Here's how we do it. We use just a plain old 27-gauge needle with our lens. 
We go through this tissue called the pars plana because there's no blood vessels there, so we don't cause hemorrhages. Go right into the tumor, take a sample. The sample's rinsed with some preservative solution. Then we put the plaque on the eye immediately. And we do genetic testing. And basically, patients with small melanoma 20, have a 25% risk for having bad genetics, monosomy 3. Larger melanoma has a 50% risk for monosomy 3. Patients who have monosomy 3, uh, we call these patients high-risk patients for metastatic disease. Dr. Sato and his team here in Philadelphia see these patients and talk to them about adjuvant therapy, additional treatment that might minimize their risk for metastatic disease. Others do the same thing. Bertil D'Amato in Liverpool does the same type of treatment. He found the same results, monosomy 3 and chromosome 8Q gain at high risk for metastatic disease. These folks, those with 3 and 8Q, are entered into studies to help minimize their risk. Same with Bill Harbour, who's doing GEP, gene expression profiling. Same thing, class 1 and class 2. Class 2 at higher risk with poorer survival, 31% survival, compared to class 1 with 95% survival. Couple questions. These questions always come up. Does fine needle aspiration biopsy seed the tumor? Generally, no. Can it be done after plaque? Yes, but I'll explain to you. We like to do it before plaque because I think you get the most accurate results. Which is better, chromosome testing, DNA, or gene expression profiling, RNA? You heard that little argument or discussion yesterday. I think they're both the same. What other tests should you do? Well, there are other tests available. I'll explain what they mean. Let's talk with seeding from needle biopsy. We've done about 2,000 biopsies for genetic testing. We've had no spread that I am convinced of. I know of one patient out of 2,000 who had a spot remote from where we did our biopsy, and that spot was removed, and it was melanoma. But I'm not convinced that we've had spread in any case. Jerry, are you convinced? No. no. Answer? That was a pretty definite no. OK. <laughs> Uh, we, do, we use very clean technique. We don't dissect. We don't do instruments. We just go in with that needle. We come out with that needle. That's it. And we put the radiation on. We send it directly to the University of Pennsylvania Genetics Lab, and it's very cost effective. This is their website. They don't advertise anything. They're just plain, old-fashioned excellence in science. The University of Pennsylvania. Perelman School of Medicine. They offer genetic testing for many different conditions, including melanoma. We use them because of the purity of their science. They provide prognostic evaluation. You heard Dr. Ganguly yesterday. The testing will detect alterations over 99% of the time. Question, can it be done after plaque? I used to tell patients it's not maybe that reliable, but we don't know what the results mean, and Tim Murray from Miami just gave a paper last month on doing genetic testing after plaque radiation. He said it can be done. He, does, he can stratify patients into high and low risk. He's not sure what the results mean. So it can be done. I don't know if I would hang my hat on the results. OK, this is the real million dollar question, which is better, DNA or RNA? I think they're both the same. You're going to hear arguments one way or the other. Here's a very good scientific paper just from last month. Big meeting, International Society of Ocular Oncology. Sarah Kuplin with Taro Cavella. Kuplin's from Liverpool, Cavella's from Finland. Gross Nicholas is from Emory in Atlanta. D'Amato is from uh, now in San Francisco. Bergstrom's from Atlanta, Jill Wells, Atlanta. They compared DNA versus RNA. You know what they found? They're the same. One's not better than the other. They said RNA and DNA. They did the comparison, same patients. They compared the both, and they said we got similar results. So we're lucky, and in, in here in Philly, we have the University of Pennsylvania Diagnostic Lab. It's scientific. It's not for profit. It's less expensive than other tests, very reliable, no bias. And there are other tests that they offer. I'll get into this when you might need to get those tests done. So what other tests to do? 
there are, there's going to be a lot of tests coming up. I mean, this, this is going to change year by year. So this, whatever we tell you this year may not apply for next year. GNAQ, GNA11, and BAP1. We usually recommend these tests to be done when someone has another family member with melanoma of the eye or when the family has a lot of cancer. We know that these are cancer predisposition genes. And so um, our center here at University of Pennsylvania offers this and other centers do offer these three additional tests. What, how does this benefit you? Well, it doesn't necessarily benefit you, but it benefits your family members. Because if they are at high risk, if they do carry any one of these three mutations, then they should be screened for other cancers, ovarian cancer, skin melanoma, other unusual cancers, pancreatic cancers, et cetera. Those of you who are really scientific, there are some really good editorials that have been written. Uh, the group at U University of Pennsylvania have written editorials on taking the guesswork out of uveal melanoma. We're currently working with them in a mouse model where we create melanoma in the mouse we're testing the genetic mutation, and then we're trialing medications on these mice, soon to be sent into a human model. A few years ago, I wrote an editorial with our team. I'm an oncologist. Arupa's the geneticist. Joan O'Brien's an oncologist and a geneticist. Takami's a melanoma oncologist, and Jerry's an on ocular oncologist. We talked about uveal melanoma trapped in the Temple of Doom, Temple of Doom being the Indiana Jones movie. We said we feel like we're Indiana Jones getting little clues about melanoma. This DNA is wrong, that DNA is wrong, this pathway is wrong, and we want to put it together so we can definitely trap melanoma and improve prognosis for patients with melanoma. And our concluding paragraph in that editorial was, now is a very exciting time for uveal melanoma investigators. Major strides are coming from teams around the world, not just Philadelphia, Columbus or Denver, from everywhere people are working on melanoma. We're unmasking secrets of melanoma. We feel we've trapped it like Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom, and we are going, we are destined to unwind its molecular profile and figure out better ways for treatment systemically. So over the past hour, we've covered a lot about causes of melanoma. You know what melanocytosis is and nevus. A little bit about features, a little bit about therapy, the collaborative ocular melanoma study, and um, spend a little bit of time on prognosis and genetic testing. For those of you who are really interested, I have that Temple of Doom article. You might want to read it. It kind of summarizes what was current as of last year in genetics of melanoma. Things change year to year. Thank you. burning questions and Peter and yeah, Colleen and Jerry. Yeah. You mentioned thickness, 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 and then in the bison you said um, diameter. Now, I was told that mine was very large. It was two and a half millimeters thick, but 16 millimeters wide. Yeah. Obviously, in your definition, it was small. Yeah. So you have a subset of melanoma called diffuse melanoma that tends to have a big base and a small thickness. And you remember I showed that AJCC table? So yours would not fit into a one, it's probably into a two or three. So base and thickness is important. Why do we kind of hang on thickness? Because thickness can be very accurately measured with an ultrasound. Base is me trusting myself to superimpose and me trusting Colleen to superimpose. So we like ultrasound because her measurement on ultrasound will likely be the same as my measurement on So. Both are really important. And not one of these factors, like thickness or AJCC or genetics, is foolproof. We tend to use them all together. We, we have a question, actually, from our live stream. For those of you who are talking to folks at home, we actually are live streaming this event, so we are getting questions coming in real time. Um, and someone asked, what is the maximum large size margins and location of ocular melanoma? Will still qualify for treatment with proton beam. Same question for the treatment of large tumor with black. Mm -hmm. So we can generally irradiate up to 18 millimeters in diameter, and in general, 
12 millimeters in thickness, but the thicker we, and we can get very good results, but the vision would be poor. You agree, Jerry, Colleen, Peter? About 18 in diameter, because the size of our radiation, the largest plaque that we would feel comfortable putting on the eye is 22 millimeters. So that 18 plus 2 plus 2 gives you 22 in base. But the thicker the tumor we irradiate, the more likely the patient's going to have bad vision and a lot of side effects. I think for very large tumors where you've got a decision, plaque versus proton beam, sure, you can treat them with both, and proton beam doesn't require that much surgery. However, tumors that big treated with proton beam as well as plaque, the patient's going to lose virtually all their vision. Yeah. So then that's when we, you know, we, you try to balance it for the patient. Uh, many of those eyes, we would suggest if they're 10 or 12 millimeters in thickness, come to a nucleation. I think one other thing that's important is the patient's quality of life. Because if you have a huge melanoma in which the vision is going to be entirely lost in the long run anyway, if you use the plaque, they're back for many visits, many ultrasounds, much worry about whether the tumor is still viable, etc. And they're not going to have any vision. Whereas if you use uh, the enucleation, their visit may be back once a year, and all the expense of many ultrasounds and so forth are eliminated. So you have to use your head. And some people say, well, with proton beam, I can treat any size tumor, filling the whole eye. Don't believe that's a good philosophy. You should do what's in the best interest of the patient and what their best quality of life will be. There was actually a, Cruikshank did a study in the cloud of ocular melanoma study on quality of life for patients with uveal melanoma comparing ri plaque radiation versus enucleation, and the results were surprising to me. They found that patients who had enucleation had a slightly better quality of life than patients who had radiation. And some of this was based on the difficulty it is to adapt to a blurred vision and a clear vision, um, and the multiple visits. They f slightly better quality of life with enucleation. Now, if you present that to most patients, most patients will say, fine, I still want to have my eyes saved. I would think most patients would say that. Question? I can speak for plaque. Peter, you might speak for proton beam. I can sp speak for plaque. If a patient has recurrence after plaque and it's m minimal, we'll try to TTT it, to laser it, if it's minimal. If it's more than minimal, like three or four millimeters, we'll re-irradiate. So um, I would think that maybe 1% or less of our patients do have to have a second plaque. We have one, one question from Elizabeth McBride. It says, what is the risk of that's a very rare combination of conditions. So here's a patient who has a melanoma in the eye, and then they have a whole completely different second condition called primary acquired melanosis, which is pigmentation on the conjunctiva that can lead to a different type of melanoma. The different type of melanoma is called conjunctival melanoma, completely different than uveal melanoma. Um, I don't think it's any higher risk than the population, and the standard risk of transformation of melanosis on the conjunctiva into melanoma is about one in three, 30 percent or less. Maybe not relevant for all of us, but uh, why would uh, you not treat nevi in children with something invasive, invasive like this? Because a child gets to be 30 years old, and the, the chance of, of something very bad happening is very much larger. You've hit the nail on the head. Nevi are benign. We would love to treat every nevus and eradicate the risk for melanoma, but we will be causing an unnecessarily high rate of vision loss in patients who would otherwise have been perfectly fine but you hit the nail on the head. I think we need to be a little more vigilant in looking at nevi and identifying the shaky nevi and eradicating them earlier. And we, 
dermatology has the luxury of taking off a nevus. If it doesn't look right, they can take it off. For us, if we don't like the look of a nevus, our treatment could theoretically cause blindness in the patient. So you really have to feel certain that that nevus is at risk. But I think you hit the nail on the head, and I'm hoping we come up with a treatment that is less damaging than lasers or radiation in the future for patients with nevi. Rather than rushing in to treat all patients with nevi, we raise that question from time to time. But if you did that, considering the frequency of nevus in the population and the frequency of melanoma, there would be thousands of unnecessary treatments to people that don't need it, involving damage to the retina, uh, expense, and so forth. So these risk factors that Carol mentioned are truly, in these small lesions, much more important than whether it's a nevus or a melanoma. The risk factors are very important, and every patient gets those put into the equation. And if a nevus is really suspicious, then you would treat it. But if you said, well, let's enucleate every eye with a small nevus in the population, we would cure melanomas forever. But for, unfortunately, they're never detected that early, and you wouldn't do that anyway with someone with perfect vision and low risk of metastasis. What is it about ciliary body involvement that leads to a poorer prognosis? Yeah, ciliary body, so the eye is divided into three, uh, the uvea is divided into three parts. The iris, then behind it is the ciliary body, then behind that is the big expanse of the choroid. And most melanoma originate in the choroid, very few in the iris, the front of the eye, and maybe maybe 90 percent in the choroid, maybe 8 percent in the ciliary body, and maybe 2 percent in the iris. Iris carries the best prognosis because they're caught really early. They're tiny. The patient sees them because their blue eye has a brown spot on it. They're caught early. Um, choroidal melanoma <laughs> tend to be caught at an, you know, when they're medium size, 5 millimeters. Ciliary body melanoma tends to be large. It hides out behind the iris. So number one, they're large. Number two, they have an exuberant blood supply there, big vessels in the ciliary body. And number three, we don't know why they are more malignant. There's some other factor that makes them a little bit more malignant. We have found with genetic testing, the closer you get to the ciliary body, the more likely you're to have monosomy 3, but even by genetic testing. The further from the fovea, the more likely it is, and the thicker the tumor. It makes sense because as tumors get thicker and thicker, they're undergoing mitosis. The more mitosis you undergo, the more likely you're to get more mutations with each mitosis. And tumors in the ciliary body, bigger, probably have a billion mitotic events leading to a higher risk for genetic mutation. But there's something else about ciliary body tumors I don't think any of us understand that makes them a little bit more malignant. If the, uh, at the time the eye was flat, if uh, TTT was not performed, is there any advantage to going back later and performing it? And if so, how much time can elapse between yeah. those two? Okay, so the question is uh, about TTT following radiotherapy. Not everyone gets TTT. It's mostly patients who have tumors in the back of the eye. Tumors a little bit more towards the front of the eye, we can't reach with TTT. Um, and in general, we don't add TTT to their regimen because we can't reach the entire tumor. Um, it can be done post plaque. If the tumor is completely regressed, we don't see the need for it because in general uh, we use it to prevent recurrence and if the tumor is regressed without recurrence then we don't see the need for it. Hi, I had gamma knife two months ago. Do you have any data? Do you know anything about the results of that? Because nobody could tell me anything about yeah. it. So uh, the question is about gamma knife. There's different ways to deliver radiation. Uh, most of us in the States use plaque brachytherapy. Uh, using iodine. If you go over to Europe, they use plaque brachytherapy with ruthenium, a dif different isotope. Over in, and in the U.S., we also, some centers use proton beam or charged particle helium ion. Um, gamma knife is another way to irradiate a melanoma. Uh, that's used in Boston, and it's used in uh, Austria, and in Italy. 
Gamma knife, for those of you who don't know, requires you to have this kind of helmet on your head where little beams are focused on one point and it gives a powerful dose at that one point. It's very precise. It's used to treat brain tumors. There's not a lot of use, not, not many people have used it to treat melanoma of the eye. I suspect it's equally effective to the other forms of radiation. Um, there haven't been big series published on it. The most you're going to find is from Austria, and they claim it does cause complete involution of melanoma, especially large melanoma. So I think it's very similar to proton beam and plaque. during um, what we were just watching, is there a link that could be determined if you have children, a parent who has the uveal melanoma, if they had the biopsy done, is there a part of that DNA that could determine whether or not it's likely that it could be passed on to the kids? Okay, okay so, so if, question, question is, is if the melanoma was sampled, um, is there any application to the kids? If we had blood from the affected patient, we would check the blood f for those three things, GNAQ, GNA11, BAP1, and we would check the child's blood if we want to see if there's a family predisposition, but not from the tumor itself. That tumor kind of happens independently of what genes and chromosomes the kids, the kids inherited. So if he, didn't, if he opted out of the genetic test, but just his blood work alone would be enough to determine? Yeah. I would have to defer that to a geneticist. Um, you might, I mean, I could ask Dr. Arupa um, if BAP1, GNAQ, and GNA11, without having the parents' results, if just doing it on you or me um, would be beneficial. So we had, a, um, I had to take our daughter to CHOP for an eye infection, which turned into a sheer panic because of the history. And he was very familiar with uveal melanoma, and I was under the impression there was no link. And he said, actually, they're thinking there could be. So just make sure you get your kids examined every two years. Okay. So we used to always teach that uveal melanoma shows nearly zero inheritance. So you don't transmit it to your kids. But there is this little select group of people who might carry one of those three mutations where their family is predispos predisposed. So that would be GNAQ, GNA11, and BAP1 testing. That's available, I think, by, I think it's available by Castle and it's available at UPenn. Oh, okay. So would we discuss that with Shields or with the pediatrician or both? Or? Um, you can discuss it with Shields. We can get that, the blood drawn and sent. Oh, okay. So his next appointment. Will or be you, the pediatrician. Great. Thank you. Well, join me in uh, thanking Carol and Jerry for being here.